Welcome to the online ministry of Park Street Baptist Church of Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. We wish you could attend in person, but trust that God will bless you through the music and the study of His Word. Thank you for joining us. Verse 9 of Acts chapter 9, and I'd like to pick it up at Acts chapter 9, verse 10, because the story of Saul is really, uh, it's, it's, it's half done at verse 9, and the second part of this story, verses 10 through 22, uh, fill in some blanks. But not only do they fill in blanks of Saul's conversion and the hours after his conversion, but they introduce us to a person named Ananias. Uh, none of us here today will be a missionary to the Gentiles like uh, Saul was, but all of us here today could be Ananias. And I want you to see why I say that uh, this morning. So Acts of the Apostles, Chapter 9 at verse 10. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, 
I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the Damascus disciples. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Over the years, I have watched with fascination as people pursue their dreams for their lives. Some take hold of a vision, pursue it vigorously, and achieve success. Others start out with a dream, a vision, a purpose, but never see that dream or subsequent dreams fulfilled. They seem to go through life with a constant sense of unfinished business. It's caused me to ask a question. What keeps people from realizing their full potential? Without doubt, there are many, many answers to that question. I offer three this morning. First, health issues arise or health fails and changes the course of one's life. How many times some of you here today have gone through that, where something happened, an unexpected health situation, either in your life or an extended family member's life, that changed the course of your life? Second, The world changes, the business world changes, and the opportunities that we believe would be there no longer are. Again, our times that we're living in right now are proof of that very thing. As we live in this post-pandemic world, the world has changed, and many of the things that we took for granted in terms of opportunities for employment before the pandemic no longer are. Third, events take place in our personal lives that fundamentally alter the course that we set out on. And again, if I was to stop right now and ask you for your story, uh, lots of you would say, something happened. Uh, Divorce took place in my life. Uh, A child was born that had uh, major health issues, uh, a, a business closed, any number of things, unpredictable things that came that changed the course of your life. But aside from these reasons and others over which we have no control, I believe that there is one reason over which we do have control that may well be even more significant than the ones I have mentioned already. And that reason is fear. Fear of taking a risk and moving beyond the known experiences of our lives is the single most important reason why people do not realize their full potential. In a sentence... The security of what is blocks the possibility of what can be. The security of what we have 
what we want to hold on to blocks the possibility of what could possibly be. But this failure to realize our potential in our personal lives can also be true in our spiritual lives and our relationship with God. Because the thing that keeps God's people from experiencing all that God has for them is also fear. And the example that I would bring to your attention today from the Scriptures is the story of a man named Ananias. Ananias is one of the unsung heroes of the earliest church. But his overcoming of his fear and his willingness to take the risk of obedience is one of the reasons why you and I have the privilege of experiencing the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives today. Ananias' story is intertwined with the story of Saul of Tarsus as recorded in Acts chapter 9. Saul of Tarsus, as has been read, was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem for trial persons who had accepted the Messiahship of Jesus. On his way, the Lord intercepted Saul's life by knocking him to the ground with a light that flashed from heaven, rendering him blind. The voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Those with Saul, who of course became Paul, led him into Damascus, where his blindness continued for three days. This is where Ananias fits into the story. Verses nine through, chapter 9, verses 10 through 16, I have called the call to obedience. The call to obedience. The same Lord Jesus who intercepted Saul's journey now issues to Ananias a call to obedience. Ananias had two necessary qualifications to be the Lord's messenger to Saul. He was in Damascus, so he was in the right place. And he was already a disciple, so he was the right person. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, same as what he had said to Saul, Saul, Saul. This time, it's in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. I love the fact that Saul, who had gotten his life straightened out, was waiting for the Lord's instructions on Straight Street. And ask for a man named Saul, for he is praying. Now Ananias may well legitimately have asked or wondered to whom Saul was praying. Because this Saul character had a reputation. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The restoration of physical sight and spiritual life is really what is at stake here. But this is where fear rears its ugly head. The fear factor becomes an immediate issue in Ananias' life. Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and the havoc that he has caused to your saints, your followers in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. I'm one of the people he's after. Lord, I know this man's reputation and purpose. Count me out. To which the Lord says, what? Go! This man is my chosen instrument. Imagine that. 
Imagine that. This man, Saul, is God's chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and also before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The radical nature of Ananias' call to obedience is very clear. Ananias is faced with a decision. So are we. So are we. Will Ananias, will you and I, overcome our fear and take the risk of obedience? Well, the answer for Ananias is in Scripture. The risk of obedience, verses 19 to, verses 17 to 19, the first half of verse 19. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Now, I have wondered so many times when I've read this story, reflected on it, I wonder if Ananias waited to the last possible moment. I wonder if he paced up and down the street before he knocked on that door. I wonder if his heart was just pounding as he wondered how he would be received. See, there's three days of blindness here. It may well be that Ananias was two and a half of those days deciding whether he was really going to obey God. But the reality is this. He obeyed. Then Ananias went to the house. I love how often in Scripture we just get this one sentence (laughs) that says, this happened. We're not given details. It just, it happened. I wonder how long he stood there before he knocked on the door. I wonder if he questioned whether God had really spoken to him and given him this instruction. Maybe this wasn't God at all that had spoken. Well, the next scene and the words spoken tell us that Ananias was really committed to risky obedience. Listen to these words, friends. They're just so powerful. We gloss over them. They're so meaningful, and yet we just read them, and we don't pick up what's really here. Placing his hands on Saul, he said to him, Brother Saul. Now, three days before, he was literally a mortal enemy of Ananias. We used to say, brother and sister, in Methodism, in the Free Methodist Church, where I was born and raised and have ministered for these years, we used to call our brothers and sisters in Christ brother and sister. I I think it had real meaning and, and significance. We don't do that anymore, and that's fine. But here, it is clear what it means. This man is my brother in Christ. God has done something in Saul's life. He's my brother. He's my friend. He's my fellow believer. He's someone with whom I will spend eternity. Do we see each other that way? Especially when we're in conflict. Brother Saul. That's all we need to know. (laughs) That's all we need to know. We know how this story is going to end because we got that information in two words. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediate response. The scales fell off his eyes. His sight was returned. He was baptized. Can you imagine that? He was baptized. I think we hold off baptism too long sometimes in the Christian family, in in our generation. He didn't have any catechism classes. There was no baptism membership class 
They just took him and baptized him. Because baptism, remember, is an outward sign of an inward reality. It isn't a statement of how much maturity a believer has. It's a statement of faith. It's a confession. And in the earliest church, we find that in the book of Acts constantly, that baptism was almost immediate. And it was in this, in this situation. Took some food, regained his strength. So Ananias heard a call to obey, and he took the risk of obedience. So what are the results of Ananias' obedience? Well, it's just amazing. He changed, Saul changed almost immediately. The disciples he came to arrest were now his hosts, and he was their guest for several days. Remarkably, verse 20, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, it was just hours before, literally, that he was marching up the Damascus Road with the very opposite agenda, to try and convince people that Jesus was not the Son of God. Now he's in the synagogue the meeting place of the Jewish people. And they're astonished by it. Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? Didn't he come here to arrest us? Yet Saul became more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. And that becomes the harbinger of his entire ministry. Where Saul then becomes Paul, and his whole purpose is convincing anyone who will listen that Jesus is the Messiah. Amazing results, all because of Ananias' obedience. But what of Ananias? He is never mentioned again in the New Testament. Paul refers to him in Acts chapter 22 when he tells his story when he gives his testimony. But in terms of any particular reference or any involvement that Ananias might have had in the earliest church, that is, it it is never recorded. This is his one moment. But had Ananias not heard the call to obedience and taken the risk of obedience... The result of his obedience, namely the ministry of Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles, might never have taken place. Now I want to bring this full circle to you and I. What causes us to fail to experience all that God has for us in our walk with him? Fear. Fear. And the only way to overcome that fear and to open our lives fully to God's plan and purpose is risky obedience. Three quick observations about obedience. First, I have garnered these over the course of my own spiritual journey, walk with the Lord. First, obedience is optional. Obedience is optional. Here's what I mean. God calls everyone to a life of obedience, but each of us have a choice as to whether to say yes or no. This is all tied up in the concept of worship. Worship is only worship if I have the choice not to worship. Worship is only meaningful if I have a volitional choice to worship. If I do not have the choice to worship, then it's not worship. It's only being a puppet on a string, being forced to bend the knee. So obedience is optional. Now, let me quickly add this. Obedience is optional, but the consequences of disobedience are not optional. 
if we disobey, certain things are set up, consequences evolve that can be for the course of a lifetime. God says to us, don't do this. We go ahead and do it. And guess what happens? We're living with the results of that the rest of our days. So obedience is far better than disobedience. We have the choice to disobey. That's the volitional human free will thing that God has given to us so that worship is not just by rote. But when we disobey, we set up events that can affect the rest of our lives. So obedience is optional. Ananias had a choice. So do you and I. Number two, obedience is risky. So here's a little syllogism for you. Risk is necessary in order for us to grow. God wants us to grow. Therefore, he is going to ask us to take risks. But, but, it is only risky from our perspective. From God's perspective, it's not risky at all. It's His plan. He's inviting us to walk through that door of risk because He knows what's on the other side of it. From our perspective, it looks like horrendous risk. From his perspective, it's what we're supposed to do. I think this is particularly true in the church today. All churches are going through tremendous change. Uh, I've now had the privilege of speaking in 42 different churches in the eight years since I've retired. And the same kinds of things we're seeing across the board, every denomination, and I think that one of the things that God is doing at this point in time, I love the daily vacation Bible day. Those are the kind of creative things that have got to happen. The street, Thursday night, I'll be praying for you, Joe, and your team. We've got to get out of the comfortable spot that we've, that we've enjoyed because the culture has moved. It is no longer friendly to the Christian faith. But God knows that. <laughs> he knows that. And he's saying, look, at you've got some risks to take. Park Street Baptist has got some big decisions to make, no doubt, in the next three, five years, ten years. But God knows that already, and he's saying, please, open up that door. Walk through that opportunity. Yes, there's risk involved, but I know what I'm doing, and I'll lead you, and I'll guide you, and I'll direct you. Uh, this is not, of course, an original sentence with me. Many of you will have heard it before, but it's a great sentence. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. And that's, I think, the whole issue of the risk that's involved in obedience. Again, risky from our perspective, but not from God's. Number three, obedience will not only change your life, but inevitably it will change someone else's too. And the reality is that we will never know the extent of the impact that our obedience will have on another person. A story to conclude the message this morning. I had the privilege, Joe, of being raised in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor, but it wasn't always that. He wasn't uh, a pastor until uh, the second career in the 1950s was kind of unusual, but dad was second career in the 1950s. Before that, he farmed. And uh, just outside the little village of Athens in Leeds County, on this side of, of Brockville, on the other side of Kingston, there's a, a road out of this little village of Athens uh, called the Oak Leaf Road. I'll be on that Oak Leaf Road this week, this Saturday. Karen and I will go to my aunt's 90th birthday party at the 
farm where my dad was born and where all of my aunts and uncles, the children of William and Lily Eyre, were born. Uh, in the uh, 1930s, 1933, a tragic accident took place on the farm of William and Lily Eyre. Uh, my dad, who was 15 years old, and his brother Wesley were uh, assisting with farming. An accident took place, and Wesley was killed. Uh, July the 14th, 1933 was the accident. And uh, Dad, uh, who has left us his autobiography, now deceased um, uh, 12 years, left uh, his uh, very detailed autobiography, a great, great resource. We used it again, my first cousin Jane and I used it again this week uh, for a detail that we needed for in planning for the birthday party this, this Saturday. The long and short of the story is that Dad, through the course of uh, several events, including most importantly the death of his brother, became keenly aware of God's call on his life. But rather than obeying that call, he continued to farm. Uh, in fact, he and Grandpa uh, bought another farm, a beautiful, beautiful farm with a lovely stone house. And uh, I'll be going by it again this week and I'll look at it. And uh, the long and the short of the story is that in the uh, fall of 1951, my dad came to the place where he said yes to the call of God on his life. Uh, within just weeks, the farm was sold to a neighbor. There was an auction sale. It's, it's quite an amazing story as to what happened. Talk about the risk of obedience. <laughs> amazing the kinds of details uh, that Dad provides for us in his story, which he told us uh, while he was alive, of course, but than which he has left for us in written form. I have, as I said, I'll be going by that house, this, and by that farm this week, as I go to the, that 90th birthday party. I have asked myself innumerable times, what would have happened, what would have been my life story if dad hadn't sold the farm? Would I be living on the Oak Leaf Road? Would I be the next generation of farmers? That's 70 years ago. How would my life have been different if Dad hadn't, through the course of a number of events, which I'll not enumerate for you today, what would have happened? Now, I'm guessing that there's lots of us in this congregation, perhaps you'll see this online later and be saying the same kind of thing. You can go back to a turning point in your life and say, I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't done that or if I had done that. But here's what you don't know. You do not know 70 years from now. You have no idea what your decision today is ultimately going to, what effect it's ultimately going to have on someone else down the journey of life. See, we, we think we're an island. We think that, that what we do, what we say, what we believe is, is really a very personal kind of thing. And it is, at its core, it's very personal. But it has huge huge implications, ramifications that we have no way of ever, ever knowing this side of heaven. My sister, when we go by that house, she says, oh, I wish Dad hadn't sold the farm. That's a beautiful house. To which I have said to her many times as well, I'm so glad Dad sold the farm. I don't know your stories, individual stories today. It's possible that some of you who are young, who are here today, are right on the cusp of having to make a significant decision. Oh, take the risk of obedience, friends. You'll never regret it. 
If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, if you're here this morning or are listening to again the, the video, if you, if you have never received Jesus as your Savior, yes, it's a risk, but it's the best risk you'll ever take. As the reward is beyond, not just for this life, obviously, but for the life which is to come. And if you're a student, if you're a young adult, senior adults, I, I, as I get older, I, I'm more and more aware of the fact that, boy, oh boy, we just can't go to the sidelines. We've got work still to do within the kingdom of God. We're needed. You're needed. Don't quit. And don't give up on that idea that if we trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Lord, I thank you for the memory of my parents, my dad. I thank you that I'll have the privilege of revisiting that family history, which is really my history too, this week. And I pray that you would be in every one of our lives, no matter what age we are, it's immaterial, that you would keep calling, keep speaking, still saying, take that step. Because the risk of obedience results in living out a life that is full of joy and it fulfills your purposes for each of our lives. And we thank you in your name, amen. This is Pastor David Richardson again. Thank you for listening to this YouTube version of our Sunday service. 
We would be delighted to have you join our Sunday services in person. The sermons are live versions of what you've just heard, usually verse-by-verse teaching from the Bible. Our live worship is much more dynamic in person. It is thoughtfully and prayerfully planned and led by our worship leader, Sylvie Copland, with the help of our praise team. Please consider this your invitation to join us, if you are able. Thank you.